Welcome to another episode of Her Story. I'm Diana Bailey, Executive Director of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. We have a great show for you today. My guest today is Joe Stewart from the Baltimore Historical Society who nominated Lizette Woodworth Reese, who is a longtime educator and famous poet from Baltimore. Welcome back to the show, and I'm here this afternoon with Joe Stewart from the Baltimore City Historical Society, and they did the nomination for Lizette Woodward Reese. So we're thrilled to hear more about her. So how did the Historical Society happen to nominate her, and why? Uh, well, actually it was myself who nominated her. I happened to be the president and then the uh, past president during the couple years that, uh, that it took to get things done. And I live in the village of Waverly, which is where uh, Lizette Woodworth Reese uh, spent most of her time, during most of her life, either in or around that village uh, with relatives and family members. So I was introduced to her. At first I was introduced to her in a book about a history of Waverly, and uh, that uh, referred to her as a primary source uh, for our, hist our village history and uh, noted that she was a, a poet and uh, I went from there to wanting to learn more about her and also to read her, uh, which actually meant um, finding some old books mm -hmm. because it's not like you can go into Barnes and Noble and right. As for a Lizette Woodward Reese book, and you know, and all all dozen of them are available. Well, we were very grateful that uh, we had one donated to the center, so thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome. That was actually the Historical Society of Baltimore County, uh, which which uh, during my exploration of Lizette Wood Woodward Reese, I visited, uh, and they had a beautiful display. Uh, it's kind of moved around because they've renovated, but uh, the display included this old bookcase with all of her books and some notes, some eyeglasses, a beautiful oil painting of her. And her family saved all that, or how were you lucky enough to be able to get the And uh, it's unclear exactly where the Historical Society got some of this material. Somebody apparently did the painting and donated it to them. Some of it may have been in the family. It's it's not clear because her her papers and uh, notes are spread around. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as the uh, University of Virginia, uh, there's a, a major collection, and then the Couch um, College and uh, the Enoch Pratt Central Library. I know I am missing one or two other places that I can't think of off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned earlier that. Um um, as a poet, she served an important role of, I mean, I have the terminology correct, but of bridging the gap from Victor the Victorian period to the modern period? Yes, in that what sense, that she's, exactly? she's considered a transition mm -hmm. poet or a transitional poet and a, a renowned lyricist who um, influenced um, modern poets and, and young women who became uh, lyrist oh. poets. So that's part of her legacy then, is it? Her type of poetry inspired other women poets? Yes. Ah. Uh, and she moved out of the Victorian age, inching her way towards mm -hmm. the modern age. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you know, do you know something about her family life, her background? Uh, she had a twin sister mm -hmm. and two other sisters and a brother. Uh, she was born before the Civil War in the divided state mm -hmm. of uh, Maryland, mm -hmm. uh, in the divided city of Baltimore, mm -hmm. uh, with relatives on both the Union and the Confederate side fighting each other mm -hmm. in the Civil War. Uh, and she recalls in one of her reminiscences books, of which she wrote too, uh, seeing uh, and experiencing uh, the casket uh, come through Baltimore from Washington on the train with Lincoln's body uh, after being 
you know, shot by Booth, uh, and all of the people in the in the city uh, being out to so she know, has to a mourn. piece of history to that as well as her poetry. Yes. Mm -hmm. What were some of her other? Um, I know that Baltimore sees her as um, one of their famous daughters, but other contributions that she may have made that have made her somewhat of an unsung heroine too. Uh, it, by the way, she was often referred to as Lady Baltimore. I'm not exactly sure, you know, she, you know, would have wanted that, uh, and or that, or whether she really appreciated it. But she, you know, that was a tag. I guess they that might not have been a term they used back then, or at least, you know, now we could say hashtag. But uh, oh, that was a, okay. that was something that was a label that was put on her. She was very popular among the press and of the time, and mm -hmm. you can see if you go, you know, particularly on the Sun archives, because they've done a good job of uh, digitizing their collection. The articles from the 1880s, you know, all the way through 20th century, late 20th mm -hmm. century articles. Mm -hmm. Uh, about her, and I read, I, I know I read a hundred articles mm. about her. She was a champion by Mencken. Uh, she, Why, do you think? He loved her poetry, and oh. this was, no, he did not really know her personally, mm -hmm. but he knew of her. Uh, he did end up being a pallbearer at her funeral. Oh. Uh, but she wrote a, a poem called Tears that just like, um, um, blew his socks off, mm -hmm. and he would uh, follow her work, uh, even though he wasn't crazy about poetry himself, mm -hmm. and uh, when a new poem of hers would come out, he would say that that was the greatest thing to happen since the, uh, um, since the building of Rome. Really? You know? It's interesting, since he was Baltimore, why the two hadn't connected. Right. Well, she actually corresponded with him and mm -hmm. and you know that was a period of time when mm -hmm. writing was you know was was pretty popular among people even in the same in the arts in the same really city you know. interesting so she was also uh, she had two careers and 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 her first career was in teaching and she was a teacher for 48 years mm -hmm. 45 of which were in the public schools of, of Baltimore City uh, uh, including a variety of schools, one of which was a colored school where she worked for three years until the, until the school board uh, agreed to the request that only colored teachers uh, be teaching in colored schools, and that was a request of the black community. Uh, she, taught, she started at St. John's, which was the church that she went to in the village of Waverly, which is still there, and where she's buried. Uh, and then she taught in a German school downtown, mm. in which half the day was taught in English and half the day was taught in German. Mm. Uh, and then her last school was Western High, mm. which is where the she was loved and where the students and the alumni uh, collected funds to put a monument to the poem Tears uh, on the wall in their school by um, Hans Schuler, and mm -hmm. that that has moved around when you know Western High has been from one location mm -hmm. to another. So she was very she was a popular teacher, mm -hmm. and of course she was known for also being a published poet. Though the further she got into her career, and and then when she was retired from teaching, the more of her books. Came sure. out. Someplace I read that she said when she was a teacher, of course, she was very busy and didn't have time at the end of the day right. to, to write that much, or she was just too tired to think in poetry. Yes. So that's, that's a very common life of a teacher, so, so yeah. she had that experience as well. It's too bad that we couldn't have gotten more, more work out of her, more poetry work earlier in her life, so we would have had a, a larger body of her work. Right. Wow. There's a great story that appeared in The Sun and the uh, So a secretary of hers, uh, in the 1950s was uh, reported to say that she, um, Elisette, like Poe, composed uh, poetry in, you know, in her head 
uh, as she waited for the rambling streetcars to come yeah. by to take her to work. And then, of course, she, you know, at some point later on, when she had time, take out a little no piece of note paper, you know, and a pencil, and and uh, and and put it put it to pencil. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, she's also uh, a woman who helped to organize uh, and uh, sustain literary circles and organizations like the Women's Club that were a place where wil women became mm -hmm. welcome and also where women were nurtured. For their writing and for their poetry and other kinds of arts. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so she was helping the next generation to who do you think her mentors were? Does she have any that you know? Um, well, I, sh I know she was influenced by her mother. I'm not so sure. It was always um, in a positive vein. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, she loved to read, you know, from, from an early uh, age. Mm -hmm. She just read, and she read widely. Mm -hmm. She was an English teacher, right? She was. Yeah. And I wonder, would, would she have... Shakespeare as her favorite, or did she have favorites in terms of her English background? Uh, I'm course? not sure. I'm, I'm not aware of her mm -hmm. having favorites. And if you read one of her reminiscences, you know, she talks about a lot of writers, but she doesn't really single anybody, mm -hmm. anybody out. Mm -hmm. Nice. So you mentioned um, that she was doing a lot of work promoting other women to be in, in the arts or in writing careers. and. Um, are some of her, I guess her students wouldn't still be alive, but the plaque you say is in the in the school um, is actually of the tears, the, her poem and the right. tears. Are, do you know of other things that are happening with her work besides what's well, the display I, that's I, in the library? I was recently canvassing for one of the candidates who's running for mm -hmm. mayor, mm -hmm. and I knocked on the door of a woman who was in her 90s, an African-American woman in her 90s who's definitely voting this time around, mm -hmm. um, uh, who told me that she taught at Western High. And I asked her, well, I asked her if she knew who Lizette Woodward Reese was, and she did. And I said, you know, she's being inducted into the nice. Women's Hall of Fame, even though I was supposed to be talking about this mayoral, <laughs> mayoral candidate. And she said she remembered the 50th anniversary of you know, of her death, the ceremony where all the women came together, the students and alumni, and the songs that were sung and the poems that were read, and she, I could just tell that she just was tickled by, by this. So and, her poetry uh, legacy lives on. Yes, and uh, again, at, at Eastern High, which is not where she taught, but where she graduated from, mm -hmm. at an earlier version of Eastern High than the last version, which mm -hmm. was on, is now closed, but was on 33rd Street. Mm -hmm. she, she went to school downtown, but uh, the alum, a, a fan of hers who was a sculptor, Grace Turnbull, uh, designed, sculpted a sculpture statue called the Good Shepherd, mm -hmm. engraved in which is another one of her poems oh. about a shepherd. Uh, Where is that? And that is now at what's called Hopkins at Eastern, the old Eastern High building, mm -hmm. uh, where it used to be behind the school and until Eastern was closed down and uh, the statue was moved to the school that Eastern High students were merged with in Clifton Park. Mm -hmm. And then when, the, when uh, Hopkins at Eastern renovated the old building, the alumni from Eastern High got together and said, we want to bring the statue back. back. Good. And they did, and it's there. I mean, it took a lot of work and effort and money to do that. But now it sits on a hill, you know, overlooking North Baltimore. So Lizette is very much present in Baltimore today. Yes. Well, Joe, we've heard a lot about her, and now I'd really like to hear one of her poems. Would you share one with us, please? Sure. I, I need to take my glasses off to do that. I'm reading uh, from uh, a Lizette Woodward Reese poem, which appropriately for today and many other days in April is, Oh, gray and tender is the rain. 
Oh, gray and tender is the rain that drips, drips on the pane. A hundred things come in the door, the scent of herbs, the thought of yore. I see the pool out in the grass, a bit of broken glass, the red flags running wet and straight down to the little flapping gate. Lombardy poplars tall and three across the road I see. There is no loveliness so plain as a tall poplar in the rain. But oh, the hundred things and more that come in at the door, the smack of mint, old joy, old pain, caught in the gray and tender rain. Well, Joe, that was perfect. And especially since the rain started out today, thank you so much for sharing one of her poems. Sure. Joe, thank you very much for being here today. It was great to hear more about Lizette and her story. And we'll be right back. Our final inductee this evening is Ms. Lizette Whitworth Reese. by Joe Stewart, the past president and current recording secretary for the Baltimore City Historical Society and a Waverly Village restaurant historian. An accomplished and compelling poet, Lizette Woodward Reese was hailed by the Baltimore Sun during her lifetime as one of the most distinguished poets in the country. Others said that she influenced American lyric poetry as no other woman ever has. Lizette Woodworth Reese and her twin sister were born in Baltimore in 1831. She grew up in Baltimore and taught school there for 48 years. She once wrote that in passing a public school building, every American citizen should feel like uncovering his head in salute to those within who are spending their span of life in the nobilities and sacrifices of this spacious and most ancient of professions. Her first poem was published in 1874. Her first book of poems was published in 1977, followed by at least a dozen more. In 1931, she was named Poet Laureate of the State of Maryland and was granted an honorary doctoral degree from Goucher College. Lizette Woodworth Reese died at the age of 79 on December 17, 1935, but her extraordinary legacy of beautiful poetry will live on forever. Mr. Stewart, we thank you for bringing her to us and we honor her posthumously. Would you like to come and speak? I can either see you or, or uh, read what I have to say. You know. uh, <laughs> In a life spanning the Civil War and Great Depression, she became a single-minded, self-supporting woman with a strong sense of values, which she stuck to and would not betray for the sake of fashion or personal gain. She was hardworking, independent, and extraordinarily gifted with a beautiful, lyrical, and spiritual inner voice. Not only did she teach thousands of students for 48 years in school, but her musings were published in a dozen books. She also helped organize and sustain literary circles and organizations where women were welcomed and nurtured. Lizette Woodworth Reese's two volumes of social history have given us a keen, sensitive look at the world she lived in, where wrenching rapid revolutionary change transformed the landscape and lives of her fellow villagers. Much like our own lives are being transformed today by changing technology, chaos and unpredictable upheaval. A village, a Victorian village in the York Road can be read as testaments to her ability and strength in preserving for prosperity at least a picture of the environment around her as it was disappearing every day and in capturing 
the calm fortitude of folks who simply and courageously carry on while the world around them spun out of their control. Thank you for honoring this very special woman and please to lead to make sure that we do carry on her legacy. Please do read and share her volumes and songs. An extraordinary group of women that we have inducted this evening into the Hall of Fame. Don't you agree? Yes. So another round, another round of applause. The names, photographs, and biographies of all six of the honorees will be permanently posted on the website of the Maryland State Archives and will be displayed on a plaque at the Maryland Women's Heritage Center as well. Here to present this year's plaque is Delegate Susan McComas. She's represented, who, who uh, serves as the president of the Women of the General Assembly. And here to receive the plaque is Ms. Diane Bailey, Managing Director of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. We actually do have a woman legislator with us now. <laughs> this is Delegate Karen Lewis Young, who was on the selection committee for the Women of Tomorrow, and her husband, Senator Ron Young, are with us. So. so much for giving me this honor you know we were both in session tonight and we got out maybe 10 minutes ago and of course my husband wanted to go to dinner and I said no this is more important I'm going and he wanted to join us so it's my honor to be able to present this class and now who you are okay Sorry, not totally with the program. I had to readjust very quickly. But thanks again. It's an honor. And I want you to know how proud we are of all of you and happy to participate in this endeavor. Again, I'm Diana Bailey. I'm the executive director of the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. And congratulations again to the inductees. And it seems that you're kind of, we're kind of passing the torch tonight because Tonight you are part of this organization through the Commission for Women, and now your life and legacy will be entrusted to us at the Maryland Women's Heritage Center. So um, uh, we also, uh, since 1985, we have uh, established the exhibit that's there now. Uh, we are not totally complete yet. We'll have your six panels done hopefully by mid-September, and we'll have some sort of celebration where we can recognize the past women from 1985, which is about 180 women. So it's quite impressive to see that much. So you're joining some fabulous company there. Um, in addition to the um, Women's Hall of Fame exhibit, we also have our new Images and Expressions, which is Maryland Women in the Arts. We have a STEM exhibit, which talks about Maryland women in STEM careers, as well as unsung heroines across Maryland and the or the women that were suffragettes in Maryland. So not only do we have the women in the Hall of Fame, but we also have a broad number of fabulous women, some and unsung, that are part of um, our women's community. And I'd also um, like to introduce Loretta Luminatis, who is the producer, who uh, did the interviews this afternoon uh, with the inductees, and also will have the, um, the program filmed. Those will be available later, probably on our website. We'll share that with the Commission and Women. Commission for Women as well. So again, thank you. We look forward to seeing you um, at the Hall of Fame exhibit in Baltimore. Um, there's also some information cards out front, or if you'd like to be a member or join us, uh, I'll be around this evening. Again, congratulations to the newest inductees if you're joining some great other company of women. And we've been joined by Delegate Susan Lee. Thank you. 
sorry. The six individuals that were just recognized and are being inducted are exceptional women. Women whose accomplishments and contributions will affect and benefit our state and our nation for generations to come. And ladies and gentlemen, one more round of applause. Come back and join us at the podium. Let's do another round of applause. Thank you so much, all the women, for guiding us through this wonderful program. We have a very small token of appreciation. And Samantha, thank you very much. Wow, what an evening. We have witnessed the induction of six brilliant, amazing women in the Maryland Women Hall of Fame. You know, we had a wonderful evening. Of course, we had a little bit of rain, but this could not have been possible. With our wonderful staff members, we have our executive director, Judy. Oh, we have a wonderful program, and Kathy Wise. Thank you. Now I want to thank the wonderful people, ladies who put this together, Commissioner, for the hard work for all the programs that you put it. It's a lot of work. And I want to thank Commissioner Diane Williams, Chair of the Hall of Fame. And thank you for a very extraordinary job. Appreciate it. A small token of a breeze. So we have to all eat fast.